Every once in a while, someone asks me, why, why do we sit sometimes for Scripture and why do we stand sometimes for Scripture? We stand for the words of Jesus. So if you're reading a, a gospel lesson that has the words of Jesus, we stand. Uh, the reading we're doing this morning is from Genesis, so it doesn't include the words of Jesus. And so we sit, just, just a little uh, church etiquette there in case you've ever wondered why uh, that is. How many people already knew that? Okay, good bit. A few years ago, my wife Michelle and I began attending a, an event by the Upper Room called Soul Feast, in which we gathered in Lake Genalesca, North Carolina, a United Methodist Retreat Center of the Southeast jurisdiction. And we were immediately struck at the worship services of this event by the beauty of the worship area and how it was dressed and presented for worship. As a matter of fact, each, after each service, uh, Michelle would make sure that she got a photograph of uh, the worship area. We learned that the person who did those, the art and dressed the uh, worship area was Dr. Carla Kincana, who is our guest speaker uh, today. So Carla met with some of our worship leaders yesterday to begin to talk about how we might do a little better job of using art in our worship. So you might see some, some changes in that in the uh, weeks ahead. So I'm giving you a little forewarn, uh, whatever. Uh, forewarning, smartly not a good word because uh, <laughs> You can anticipate that. <laughs> Later on, uh, as I began my doctoral studies, one of my classmates was Carla. And so we sat in uh, our core classes together. We had different uh, emphases of our degrees, but the research and core classes we had together. And so I uh, enjoyed getting to know her. Carla is the pastor of Director of Spiritual Formation at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Until a, a little over a year ago, she uh, was the Director of Field Education and Vocational Formation and Church Leadership at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, a uh, position she uh, was in for several years and was artist in residence there. She is the author of Creativity and Divine Surprise, Finding the Place of Your Resurrection, as well as numerous articles about the spiritual journey. She's authored curriculum for the United Methodist Church, and she lectures, leads workshops, and facilitates re retreats in a variety of ecumenical settings nationwide. Carla earned a baccalaureate degree in art from Virginia Wesleyan College and a Master of Divinity from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And she uh, completed a doctorate there in spiritual direction. Uh, as I said, we had classes together. She has experience in as a church pastor a college chaplain and campus minister, conflict mediator, as well as more than two decades of work in the healing arts and as a spiritual director. It's a great privilege uh, for me today to uh, introduce to you my friend and colleague, Dr. Carla Kincannon. Oh. Before she comes, I'm going to read this morning's uh, lesson, which is from Genesis. It's been one of those mornings. We've had uh, a number of uh, kind of little miscues. But we're reading from Genesis, um, kind of selected passages that highlight the uh, creative nature of God in, uh, from the book of Genesis. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, let it separate the waters from the waters. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above and earth across the dome of the sky. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creepy things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, Brian, thanks for that lovely introduction. I have to say it's really been great to be with you and Michelle this weekend and to meet members of your congregation. I want to thank you all for the warm welcome that you've uh, given me, uh, a good Midwestern welcome uh, for this person from the Southeast. Uh, And I uh, extend to you my greetings from Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Alexandria and also grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So this past Christmas, my husband Jim and I gave my parents a DNA test for their Christmas gift. The gift was something my mother really wanted and uh, my father appreciated, but I have to confess it wasn't entirely a selfless gift. I was uh, really, I've been really curious about my origins, uh, my genealogy for a long time. And so now we have an origin story that includes our DNA. And we've had one little surprise. We found out that that on my mother's side, we have Jewish blood, so mazel tov. (laughs) Um, This week's scripture, uh, this morning's scripture is an origin story, one that reveals our divine DNA. Uh, Through this ancient art form of storytelling, Genesis poetically describes where we come from. And it's a great way, stories are a great way to express these universal truths, these big mythic truths that are are too big to be expressed through just the facts. So uh, Genesis talks about where we come from, and that is we come from a God who creates and a God who loves. At each step of the, narr- of, of the story, at each point in the, narr- in the creative narrative, God is like an artist that patiently calls forth each new thing. And as God makes each new thing, God kind of steps back and says, that's good, pretty good job there. So God is just like an artist who is pleased with herself as God gazes at the wonder of creation. Um, God not only sees that it's good, but then God blesses creation. Genesis tells us that we come from a God who is the original artist. Now, there are a lot of ancient creation stories, uh, other than the one that we have in the Judeo-Christian tradition. But several of those stories depict humankind, the creation of humanity as a byproduct or as an accident or even as a mistake of the gods. However, Genesis makes it clear that God who takes delight in creation intended to create people, not on a whim, but for a reason. We are designed and fashioned with something in God's mind for us to do, someone for us to be. Now, curiously, in this creation story, humanity is not the apex, not the climax or the final goal towards which God is working. We often read the story that way, don't we, though? We we like to put human beings as the climax of the story because we kind of like to be in the center of things. So um, the creation story really is an invitation 
to imagine what our good and creative God has in mind for the good world and a beloved humanity. What if there is more creating in God's imaginations? What if God's creating is not finished yet? What if human beings have a role to play, even a bit part in the unfolding or the continuation of creation? The reading from Genesis this morning is an invitation for us to imagine how you and I, how we might continue to contribute to God's creativity, fulfilling God's desire for us and for the world. Now, if we were to read on into Genesis a little bit, just into the next chapter, uh, we would see there a second creation story. And we'd learn from that story that God's intention for creation isn't completed. As a matter of fact, that, that, God, that after, after God created first man, God also created a garden. Uh, and God gives humans then a purpose to fulfill. Humans, you and I, have a purpose. We are to add our efforts to God's creativity by tilling and keeping the earth, by tilling and keeping the garden. Now, tilling and keeping are the means by which we find our fulfillment in God and in God's purposes. But what does that mean? Well, if we take a look at the original scripture, if we look at, he at the Hebrew in, um, in the scripture, we find that the word for till is abad, abad, and that means to serve. And if we look at the word to keep, that is shamar, which means to protect. So we are created to serve God and to protect God's purposes for a beloved humanity and a good world. To understand more about God's purposes and our place in those purposes, we need to take a closer look at who God is and at who we are. In the creation story, you remember that God speaks us into being. And in Hebrew, the word that is used to describe God speaking us into existence is dabar. Dabar means word, matter, and thing kind of all rolled up into a single definition. It is a word spoken, yes, but it is also physical matter. But more than that, it is an act of creativity. Dabar is God's creative activity. And the same story tells us that you and I embody God's likeness. We embody God's debar. We have God's creative activity within us. Now, theologians came up with a term, to leave it to them to complicate things, but they came up with a term to talk about that image of God within us. They, talk, they call this the imago Dei. It's that sacred part of us, that spark within us that mirrors God, that divine spark. That imago Dei implies that because you and I bear God's image, uh, we also are creatures through whom God's plans and purposes can be carried out, can be made real. We are co-creators with God. Creativity is the authentic shape of our soul. I can just about hear some of your thoughts right now. That creative gene must have skipped a generation. <laughs> or it must be a recessive gene within me because I'm not very creative. Let me assure you that all of us are creative. We are made in the image of the creator God and the creative God. Creativity is so much more than art making or music making or dancing. We use our creativity every single day. When we juggle the family schedule, 
when we make a satisfying meal from a nearly empty pantry, when we work out a compromise between opposing parties, when we form and nurture relationships, when we grow a garden or solve a problem or work out a mathematical equation, we use our creativity. And although I am an artist and a writer, some of the most create, creative work that I have ever done was in the courts of Tennessee, working in family mediation, helping people work out their relationships in a loving and kind and compassionate way. The Imago Dei, that image of God within us, is also relational. One of uh, my favorite theologians, Karl Brart, wrote that as bearers of God's image, we are created to be in relationship with God and with one another, to love as God loves. And that takes a lot of creativity. Because if, if everyone has God's image within them, and we are to love God, we must also love one another because everyone is an expression of God. Everyone, no exceptions. So as we embrace that image of God within us, we are called to live in loving communion with one another, to get closer to one another uh, so that we can get closer to God. That image of God within us is seen in our ability to love and our ability to create. And although you and I, we each have that image of God within us, seldom does someone look at us and say, that's God, that's God. I think the original intent for our lives is often covered up by the choices we make and by the hurts that we receive in this life. The presence and the results of sin cover over that beautiful image of God within each of us. But the good news is that image can never be destroyed. One of the early bishops of the church, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, said that no matter how we've been battered in this life, no matter how we've been bruised, that that image of God remains constant, unharmed, holy, blameless, and whole. And even though sin is a present reality, nothing can destroy that image of God within us. But we have work to do, you and I, because of the presence of sin in this world, because that image has been covered over, we must till and keep our lives in order for God's image to be made visible. We need to cultivate God's image within us in much the same way that an artist cultivates her talent to paint or a musician cultivates his talent to make beautiful music. We can learn from the master, from Christ, what it means to let that image of God shine forth from within each of us. Christ has shown us what the unmarred image of God looks like, so we know what we are to become. God's presence can be made known in the world as we cultivate this image of God within us, as we grow into the likeness of Christ. Now and then, we catch a glimpse of God's image, don't we? We see it in the life of another. We see it in acts of selfless love. We see it even through gifts of creativity. You know, there have been times in my life when I've been so moved by God's presence while listening to an exquisite piece of music like we heard this morning. When gazing at a beautiful uh, painting, I've seen God's presence. When watching the human body seemingly defy gravity in the ballet, I have known God's presence. 
The arts have a way of making God's presence real to us, making the presence of the holy tangible for us. Elizabeth Gilbert tells an ancient story from the deserts of North Africa. The Moors of that region in, in ages past would gather for moonlight dancing in the desert that would go on for hours and hours. And the dances were always magnificent because the dancers were professionals. But every once in a while, something extraordinary would happen. And one of the dancers would become transcendent. We've all seen performances like that before. And, and you almost hold your breath because the moment is so full and so sacred, you don't want that moment to end. And in that moment, we catch a glimpse of the beauty of God. Centuries ago, in the deserts of North Africa, once in a great while, a dancer would twirl into one of these moments and he would be transported into a sacredness so palpable that it could be seen by others. The dancers seemed to be lit up from within, lit up on fire with divinity. And when this happened, people knew it. And they recognized that creative spark of God in the body of the dancer. And they would begin to put their hands together and to clap and to chant, God, 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 that's God. We see God in the creativity of others. Now, one of the Desert Fathers, one of the early Christians, put it this way. He talked about this inner transformation that occurs with us as we grow into the likeness of Christ. And he uses the metaphor of an artist. He says that we are made in God's image and that's like a charcoal outline of the human being. That's what it's like to be made in God's image. But he says that we are intended to grow into God's likeness. And when we grow into God's likeness, that's like God painting in that charcoal outline with color, with lots and lots of color. We were created to cooperate with God's creativity within us. We were created to become colorful people. When we use our creativity to make safe spaces for families, when we use our creativity to build loving relationships, when we use our creativity to feed the hungry, when we use our creati creativity to dance or sing or paint, when we use our creativity to worship God, when we use our creativity, God fills in the outline of our being with color, with color. Each of us bears the image of God within us. We are meant to love and to create, to grow into God's likeness. As children of creative purpose, how will you cultivate the image of God within yourself and within the world? God has need of us all. We have work to do. Let's get our hands dirty. Amen. I offer you this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Mother of us all.